Hello, everyone. First of all, a profound thank you to all of you for being here. And a profound thank you to Alex for thinking about it and then making it happen. And sometimes affirmations work big time, as uh, you've just seen. So I'm going to share with you some powerful techniques and concepts that will make you successful beyond your wildest dreams. How many of you would like to be successful beyond your wildest dreams? If you implement some of what I'm going to share with you today, that in fact is something that will happen in your life. I'm talking about making a quantum leap in your life. How do you make a quantum leap in your life? You don't do it by working harder. In fact, working harder can actually set you back. You don't do it by working smarter. You don't do it by managing your time better, which are the typical ways people think about when they say, gee, I've got to do more or accomplish more or achieve more. The only way you're going to pull this off is by thinking differently, thinking radically differently. Now, mind you, the notion of thinking differently is not new to you. You've been exposed to it early and many times. How many of you have been told to see the glass as half full rather than half empty? And do you know that every problem is an opportunity in disguise? <laughs> and when the going gets tough, the tough get going. So you're not unfamiliar with the notion of thinking differently. You not only have been exposed to it, but you probably embrace it. But despite that, the vast majority of people find it very difficult to consistently think differently. And that's because most of us try to think differently by trying to think differently. It does not work. Let me give you an example. <clears throat> Uh, I grew up in India. My father was a garment bureaucrat. My mother was a homemaker. We weren't poor, but there wasn't a whole lot of discretionary cash lying around. So one day we'd gone for a walk in Karolbag, which is a suburb in New Delhi, and we passed an open-air market, and there was a guy who had a shelf strapped to his uh, stomach so over the back. And he was selling stuff from that. And one of the things he was selling was a book called Just Like Daddy. And he spoke about a little boy who got up in the morning and he brushed his teeth just like daddy. And he did a whole bunch of things just like daddy. It was actually two books in one because if you flipped it around, it turned pink. And then there was a little girl who did things just like mommy. And I really, really, really wanted that book. So I put in a petition. And my parents had a look at it. And there were only a <clears throat> few words on each page and I was already reading junior classics, so my petition was denied. It didn't sit well with me, but, you know, that's the way life is. We walked on, and the guy with the shell walked behind, and every time I looked behind, he'd flash the book at me. <laughs> <coughs> and my mother was a very frugal lady who hardly ever bought anything for herself. But she saw a purse she really liked, and she reached for it. And I saw my opening, and I dove in like a trained seal with tears rolling down my cheeks, I bawled loudly and asked, how can she possibly buy something so utterly useless as a purse when there was this great educational material that they were denying me? It was a low blow. It worked. Back with the purse, I got just like daddy, just like mommy. There was coolness between my parents and me for a while, but I didn't care. I had what I wanted. The reason I mentioned that is because a couple of decades later, I was passing a flea market, and I saw that book, Just Like Daddy, Just Like Mommy. And all of the memories came flooding back. But there was a difference. And the difference was, I no longer wanted Just Like Daddy, Just Like Mommy. I no longer wanted it. I did not not want it. It was completely irrelevant to my life. I had outgrown my need for just like daddy, just like mommy. Right now, in your life, think back. 
Can you remember something that you desperately wanted at some stage, maybe a toy when you were young, whatever, but you really, really, really wanted it, and you can remember you really, really wanted it, but now it's totally irrelevant to your life. You have outgrown your need for it. I see a lot of nodding heads, so everybody can recall at least one such instance. Right now, there is something in your life that you do not have, and, it's, and you want it, and it's causing turmoil in your life. And the question I have for you is, would you rather get what you want, or would you rather outgrow your need for it, as I outgrew my need for just like daddy, just like mommy, and you've outgrown the need for countless things in your life? Would you rather get what you want, or would you rather outgrow your need for it? Don't answer the question, think about it. Because that is a good example of what I mean when I say part of my charter today is to help you to think differently. How many of you are entrepreneurs here? A whole bunch of you. How many of you would like to run a billion dollar company? Now think about it. Do you really want to run a billion dollar company? I would suggest to you that what you really want is how you would feel if you ran a billion dollar company. Let's go even deeper. You don't really want to feel like you would when you run a billion dollar company. You want to feel like you think you would feel if you ran a billion dollar company. Hold that thought in the back of your mind. Because right now your model is, the only way I can feel like a run a billion dollar company is if I actually go out and run a billion dollar company, I'm gonna try my darndest to do that. And that's the model that you're operating on. And it may very well be the right model for you. You're the only person who can decide that. But I'm getting you to think under the layers of what you are presently doing. Uh, <clears throat> let me tell you briefly about how I came to be doing what I'm doing. I came to America as a student. I did my PhD in uh, marketing from Columbia Business School. I went out and got a job in corporate America, and uh, <clears throat> I had a couple of lucky breaks, and I was hugely, hugely successful. Uh, one of my projects was I did the advertising for a motion picture, which went on to become one of the all-time blockbusters. In fact, even now, after nearly 50 years, it's on the list of 50 top grossing movies of all time. That was the original Exorcist. And if you look at it, The Exorcist is the only horror movie on that list. All the rest of those are general interest movies, Star Wars, Indiana Jones, Lord of the Rings, Gone with the Wind, Forrest Gump, and so on. The Exorcist is the only horror movie. So it took a particular degree of marketing acumen to make that happen. And uh, it was one of the few recommendations I made at Warner that was accepted. And to be honest, you can never tell whether the advertising made the movie successful or the movie would have been even more successful if we hadn't run the campaign. Who knows? But it succeeded. I laid claim to it and I got promoted rapidly, did wonders for my career. Then I got burnt out by corporate politics. So I said, I have a PhD. Uh, let me go to universities where there is no politics. So I made the transition. <laughs> yeah, I discovered that too, but I discovered it after I made the change. <laughs> and then I stagnated. You know, I was there getting cost of living increases, and uh, all my colleagues who had remained in the corporate world went on and, you know, achieved financial and other success, and I was stuck. And uh, I said, gee, you know, I had such a brilliant career, great education, such tremendous early success, and I've blown it all, I've ruined my life, oh, boy, is me. It was a wonderful pity, pocket, pity party of one. 
All my life I'd been doing a lot of reading, spiritual biography, mystical autobiography, and they'd take me to a wonderful place, and I came back to the real world, and it sucked. And I remember thinking, if all of this is useful, only if you're sitting quietly thinking peaceful thoughts, and not when you came to the hurly-burly, then it's useless. But somehow I knew that wasn't true. I knew that this was very valuable, maybe even the only thing that was very valuable. I just hadn't figured out how to make use of it. So one day I came up with my bright idea, which is, why don't I take the teachings of the world's great masters, strip them of religious, cultural, and other connotations, and adapt them so that they're acceptable to intelligent people in a post-industrial society. And the thought of doing that made me come alive. So I created that course because I needed it for me. My initial thought was, I teach MBAs. We all know what motivates MBAs. Nobody is going to enroll for the course. That's fine. If they did, wonderful. If they didn't, God bless them. I was going to create that course because I needed it for me. So I did. It did well. I modified it and offered it again. Did better. I moved it to Columbia Business School in 1999, and it exploded. It was the only course that was a university-wide draw. I had students from law school, business schools, international public affairs, journalism, teachers call all over the place. It also got written up in the New York Times, Fortune, Forbes, Business Week. Every major publication ran a piece of a business publication in North America and uh, the UK. Uh, mentioned it at one time or the other. And then it spread, spread by word of mouth, so I taught it at other top business schools. And then uh, I spun it out and uh, offered it privately. And it's now being offered, but it's entirely virtual because of COVID. And in the meantime, what also happened is that completely organically, by happenstance, I developed a, a coaching practice. I didn't set out to be a coach, but there were people who came up and said, you know, we really want to work with you. So that's how it happened. So I have a global clientele now with a very unique, uh, it's a very unique niche. Most of them are entrepreneurs. Some of them are very senior executives, but they all are already successful, but they want to have tremendous impact on the world. They want to make a dent in the universe, but at the same time, they have a explicit spiritual practice. And most of them had the same notion I had before, which is, gee, you know, you can either grow spiritually or you can go off and become a business titan, and you have to pick and choose. And my job is to show them you don't have to pick and choose. Pick and choose. Becoming a business titan is your path to spiritual growth. I'm going to share some of that to you. Now, I must tell you in advance, some of the concepts that I'm going to share with you today are going, uh, they're mind-blowing, and I'm saying that modestly. <laughs> and they're going to seem so outlandish that your initial reaction would be, this can't possibly be true, this guy's off the wall. But I would honestly ask you not to reject it, but simply put it down and say, you know, this is so outside the realm of what I think and believe that I've got to examine it a lot more carefully. Now, in the syllabus to my course, I, I <coughs> say, this is the syllabus to the course that I taught at many of the top business schools in America, and I say, in the syllabus, in writing, this course will profoundly change your life, and if it doesn't, we've both failed. So, it's a business school course, for heaven's sake. How can it change anyone's life? But there are a whole bunch of people who will tell you, yes, it did profoundly change my life. But let me tell you the reason I can make that statement so boldly. Remember, I already told you where I draw my material from. These are the world's greatest masters. They spoke in languages and used examples that were relevant to the time and the geography that they were in. And modern, intelligent people in a post-industrial society don't necessarily relate to them. All I've done is translate. I'm a good translator, I'll give you that. All I've done is translate. So given the source from which I draw my material, it's not a question of will it change my life, but how can it possibly not change my life? So bear that in the back of your mind. And as I said, honestly, some of the ideas that I'm going to share with you 
are going to truly knock your socks off, seriously. Let's begin with an easy one. Every single one of you is a control freak. <laughs> you have spent your entire life trying to control some part of your internal or external environment. You probably don't think of yourself as a control freak, but you are. Whole bunch of entrepreneurs here. Why did you become an entrepreneur? Well, could be because you got fed up of working for someone else, or in a job, you figured, let me go off and uh, become an entrepreneur, and that way I'll have more control over my time, and I'll do what I want, and nobody will boss me up, and I'll make a ton of money, and you know, that's the way to go. So you became an entrepreneur. Are you married? How many of you married? Why did you get married? You got married because you noticed this person of the opposite sex or the same sex, depending on your predilection, it felt good. And then 10 seconds or 10 days later, you thought about that person again, and very soon it became a full-blown obsession. And you thought, gee, you know, if you get married, there's going to be love and companionship and great sex and so on, so let's do it. <laughs> it was an attempt to control some part of your internal or external environment. Everything that you do, have done, are thinking of doing, is an attempt to control some part of your internal or external environment. Are you all with me? I got some news for you. You don't have control. You never had control. And you never will have control. The only thing you have is the illusion of control. And this is very important, so I'm going to spend some time on it. You do not have control, but you have the illusion of control. And the illusion of control comes about because many times in your life, you've been at place A and you wanted to go to place B, and you said, gee, you know, if I do X, Y, and Z, I'm going to go from A to B. And you did X, Y, and Z, and you did, in fact, go from A to B. And that happened many times in your life. It happened many times in the lives of people that you know. So you said, see, I did it. I have control. In reality, any of a number of things that could have happened to derail you did not happen. So be immensely grateful. But, and I'm sure you've experienced this many times in your life, Something comes up which is so totally unexpected that it throws all of your plans into a cocked hat. Has that ever happened to you? It has happened before. It will happen again. You do not have control. You have the illusion of control. And the illusion of control, mind you, is fantastic. I'm not knocking it at all. The illusion of control is what makes you get up in the morning, what makes you lay plans, what makes you say, this is what I'm going to do, and this is how I'm going to grow my company. The illusion of control is fantastic. But use the illusion of control knowing that it is the illusion of control, and it will break down at some point. When you use the illusion of control, knowing that it's the illusion of control, when it breaks down, you simply say, ah, oh, well, here's where it broke, broke, broke down. What do I do now? Whereas if you use the illusion of control without knowing that it's the illusion of control, that's when you start to go to pieces. Okay, so I'm not knocking the illusion of control. I'm simply saying use it knowing that that is the illusion of control. And in that sense, the pandemic was a wonderful teacher. You know, my wife and I are both tennis nuts. We've been to the French Open numerous times, went to the Australian Open three years ago. Uh, 2020 was when we were going to go to Wimbledon. And I bought the tickets well in advance, and for those of you who are into it, you know that buying good seats for the final rounds in Wimbledon is not an expense, it's a capital investment. <laughs> And at that time, if somebody had said, Sri Kumar, you won't be able to go to Wimbledon, I'd have said, yeah, possible. 
But in my head would be something like, perhaps somebody close to me fell ill as a result of which I couldn't go. It would never occur to me that I wouldn't go to Wimbledon because the tournament itself was canceled, and in any case, there were no planes flying between London and New York. The pandemic is a great lesson for nothing is under your control. And I know many people who felt that viscerally, because you might say, Jake, you know, I know things are not under control. Uh, I don't know if my kid will get into Harvard. He's got good grades, but he's not at the top. So uh, I don't know if he'll get into Harvard. I don't have control. My marriage is shaky. I don't know if he'll survive. I don't have control. But underneath all of that is a worldview you take for granted. And in that worldview, if you run out of toilet paper, you go to the grocery store and pick up a roll. If you don't have food in the house, you go to a restaurant and order off the menu and you know, you get what you ordered. As a result of the pandemic, even that was called into question. So it really brought home to you in a visceral way that you do not have control. So bear that one in, uh, <coughs> as lesson one. You do not have control. You never had control. You never will have control. You do have the illusion of control, which is a fantastic thing but use it knowing that it's the illusion of control. Now we get down to some of what I was talking about in terms of ideas which are very, very different from anything that you might have been exposed to before. And I'm going to present two or three of them, and they will seem separate, but I will tie them together, okay? The first one is, let's talk about you and the universe. And before that, I want to go to Aristotle, who had the concept of a material cause and an efficient cause. And uh, a material cause is whatever something is made out of, and an efficient cause is whoever makes the stuff. So for example, you have a pot. What is the pot made of? The pot's made of clay, right? So clay is the material cause. Who made the pot? That's easy. The potter made the pot, right? So the potter is the efficient cause. Or a gold ornament. There's a gold ornament lying around. So what's a gold ornament made of? Well, obviously gold. So that's the material cause. Who made the gold ornament? The goldsmith. So the goldsmith is the efficient cause. And it holds across the board. Who made that automobile? Well, what's the automobile made of? Well, it's made of glass and <coughs> steel and rubber and a whole bunch of other things. So those are the efficient causes. And who made it? General Motors or Toyota uh, made it. And behind each one of those is a whole plethora of uh, industries for refining, manufacturing, and so on. But the principle is exactly the same, right? Now you look around you. And when you look around you, there is this massive universe with the sun and the planets, which is in the middle of a galaxy which has a billion stars, and there's over a billion galaxies, each of which has a billion galaxies. Enormous universe. Who made the universe? Well, well, well there's this, this thing called God, and God made the universe. What did God make the universe out of? Well, there was this quantum soup lying around, you know, and he kind of played around with it to make the universe. Who made the quantum soup? Do you recognize that this gets you into an infinite regress? There's only one way out of this infinite regress. And the way out of this infinite regress is God made the universe out of himself, herself, itself. Let me repeat that. God made this universe out of himself, herself, itself. This means that everything in the universe is God's stuff. You, 
the folks at your table, the cloth on the table, cloth, uh, the <coughs> tablecloth, the you know <coughs> cosmetic uh, tubes that you have, all got stuff. The traffic outside, the doctor on the road, all got stuff. The great men of history, Lincoln, Gandhi, Mandela, all got stuff. The evil doers of history, Hitler, Stalin, all got stuff. There is nothing in the world that has been, will be, or can be anything but God stuff. So the most important question for you, and again I leave this for you to think about, is how did the one become many? If all of you are God stuff, and that incidentally is the underlying unity that all the sages and mystics think about, how did the one become many? Now hold on to that thought because we're going to come back to that. Now, how would you like it if I told you that every single one of you is a liar and you've been consistently and habitually lying your entire life? Gee, not a very good thing to insult your audience, right? But you really have been. Let's assume you're in a cocktail party and somebody comes up to you and uh, uh, says, well, who are you? And you say something like, uh, well, you know, I'm John. I'm a software engineer. And I used to really love my job. But uh, I don't so much love my job anymore. And, uh, you know, my marriage is kind of shaky. I don't know if it'll survive. You say a bunch of stuff like that, right? Now, let me ask you a question. Do any of you folks have dreams? You know, you go to bed at night, you have dreams? Let me describe for you a dream that you had. And in this dream, you were Julius Caesar. And this is one of those extraordinarily vivid dreams. Got that? You're Julius Caesar, and you're fighting with Pompey to become dictator of Rome. And you pursue Pompey across rivers, and you de his, your legions defeat his legions, and in the process, you go to Egypt, and you find out that there's this woman called Cleopatra who's battling her brother, and you decide to throw in your lot with Cleopatra, and you help her defeat uh, her brother and become empress of Egypt, and you have a brief affair with her which produces an offspring, and then you go back to Rome to celebrate your triumph, and then the Ides of March happens. And when Brutus stabs you, it's painful, and the pain is so intense, you wake up. And when you wake up, you realize it was all a dream. You created all of that. You created Julius Caesar and Pompey and the legions and the rivers you crossed and Cleopatra and her brother and Cleopatra's child and your favorite. You created all of that, but you chose to identify only with a small part of it, the part of Julius Caesar. I understand this. You created all of it but you identified with only a small part of it, the Julius Caesar part of it. And when did this become apparent to you? When you woke up. Right? Now here is the model that we have. And the model we have is, it's an enormous universe out there. And in that universe, there are billions of galaxies, and each one of those galaxies are billions of stars like our sun. And our sun is a very mediocre star in a unremarkable galaxy. 
and there's a bunch of planets floating around, and among the bunch of planets floating around this star is a tiny one called the Earth. That is really tiny, because Jupiter consists of more than 70% of all the mass of the solar system. And in that, there are you know, various land masses, and part of that land mass is something called North America, and within that, there's this place called Colorado, and within that, there's Denver, and you know, I just happen to walk. So you're an infinitely small speck in this unbelievably vast universe, and within that, there's you, and within that is your mind, and that's the model you have, right? Wrong. It is your mind that is incomprehensibly vast because the entire frigging universe is in your mind. Let me repeat that. The entire universe is in your mind. It's your mind that's vast and the universe that's a tiny speck of that. Because, let's define real as that which always exists. You all with me on that? We will define as real that which always is, okay? From that perspective, John the software engineer is not always it, because it disappears. He becomes Julius Caesar, and then he goes into deep sleep, and there's nothing. There's no Julius Caesar, there's no universe, there's no John the software engineer, right? But if somebody asks you in a cocktail party, you never ever tell him, uh, who are you? Well, um, some of the time I'm John the software engineer, and my marriage is shaky, but you know, I'm also Julius Caesar, and occasionally there's this blank where everything seems to go, <laughs> right? You never, ever say that, do you? You lie. You lie by omission, but you lie. Now, here is the point of all this. You were Julius Caesar, and you fought Pompey, and you had an affair with Cleopatra, and the Ides of March, happened and Brutus and Casca and Cassius and all of the others got you and you wake up and you say, hey, it's all a dream. In exactly the same way the world that you're living in right now where you're John the software engineer with a job you don't like and a marriage that's rocky is exactly like that dream. You created all of it but you identify with a tiny part of it, which is John the software engineer. And when do you recognize that? When you wake up. And the whole purpose of existence is for you to wake up, because remember what I said earlier, only that is real, which always is. John the software engineer isn't real, he comes and he goes. Julius Caesar isn't real, he comes and he goes. What is it that does not come and go but is always there? Your awareness that you exist, which is always there. Are you aware right now you exist? Of course. When you're Julius Caesar, of course, even in deep sleep. When you get up from deep sleep, you have to, uh, do you have to ask someone, hey, was I around? Did I sleep? No, you know. You knew you existed. That never goes away, and therefore that is real. And that is the only thing that's real. And that is who you really are. You know, say just call it by different names, but, you know, call it pure awareness, you know, your enlightened being, Brahman, there are many, many, many names for it. But you are pure awareness. You are masquerading as John the software engineer. 
And this has a profound ramification for that because in your life, there is lots and lots of sorrow. And all sorrow happens because there is you and there is somebody or something else. There is duality. But if you are pure awareness, that's who you are. And there is no your awareness and my awareness. There's only awareness, which is the underlying unity that all of the sages talk about. And that is your real nature. Your real nature is your real being is not John the software engineer. And I want you to hold on to that thought because what are you doing in life is you're working on yourself and you're working on yourself to realize this big myth that you have believed your entire life that everybody around you believes, and everybody is coaching you and conditioning you to be part of this myth. In reality, you're not a body-mind-intellect complex. You're pure awareness. You're pure consciousness. And your job is to be anchored in that rather than in the body-mind-intellect complex with all of the problems that uh, come with it. And how do you do that? And what does all of this have to do with being an entrepreneur? We're going to move into that right now. I want to share an important concept with you. And this is the concept of mental chatter. Now, mental chatter is an internal monologue that you have going on in your head all the time. Begins when you get up in the morning, is with you right through the day is with you right now, where out of politeness, you ought to be listening to my chatter, but you're off somewhere. How many of you in the time that I've been speaking have already gone someplace else? Oh, there's an email I have to reply, phone I have to make, phone call I have to make, right? I rest my case. Mental chatter is this insidious beast that's always been around. It's so much a part of your life that you might not even have noticed it until I explicitly pointed it right now. It's like an unwelcome relative who's shown up at your house and you can't throw him out. So what do you do? You live your life as best you can despite your mental chatter. You ignore it, suppress it, work around it, and try to live your life as a huge mistake. And the reason it's a huge mistake is because it's your mental chatter that is responsible for not recognizing your real self as pure awareness. Because mental chatter is always directing you outwards. And more important, your mental chatter creates the world that you live in. You think you live in a real world, you don't. You live in a construct. It's like every single one of you is living in the matrix, but this is not a matrix created by an alien civilization out to enslave you. It's something that you created with your mental chatter. One of the more powerful teachings of the Buddha was the parable of the second arrow. Has anyone here heard of the parable of the second arrow? Well, the Buddha asked Ananda, Ananda, if an arrow were to hit you in the arm, would it not be very painful? And Ananda nodded and said, yes, Lord, it would be very painful. And if a second arrow were to hit you exactly where the first arrow hit you, would it not be even more painful? Yes, Lord, it would be even more painful. And then the Buddha had a strange question. Why then do you shoot the second arrow? And I noticed some many puzzled glances, so let me illustrate, and I'll explain by means of a story. There was this woman who was a very good mother, and uh, her son turned 16, and got his provisional driver's license. And one day he comes up to the mother and says, Hey, Ma, I'm going to meet a bunch of friends, and we want to hang out, and uh, I need to take the car. 
And the mother says, of course not. You just got your provisional driver's license. Where do you have to go? I'll drop you. He says, no, no, you don't understand. It's very important that I go. It's very important I take the car. And it's very important that you not be there. And I said, ah, if I can't be there, that's fine. There's Uber, there's Lyft. Said, no, no, you don't understand. I've got to take the car. Don't you understand? I have to have the car. So she said, no. But you know how kids are. He begged and pleaded and wheedled. And bit by bit, she started giving in. So she took promises. You're not going to drink. No, no, no drink. You're going to call. Yes, I'm going to call. You'll be back by 10 o'clock. Yes, <clears throat> I'll be back by 10 o'clock. Uh, so very reluctantly, she gives him the car keys. And of course, once he gets the car, he forgets all his promises, he doesn't call, he beats curfew, has too many beers. On the way back, he has a serious accident and has to go to the hospital. He's operated on. His mother is with him in the operating room. And when he's moved to the recovery room, she dashes home to have a quick shower so she can go back to the hospital. And then a friend calls. And her friend says, what kind of a mother are you? How could you possibly have let him take the car? You're not a mother, you're a murderer. Are you shocked that a friend would say something like this at, time, at a time like this? Probably. Would you be less shocked if I said it wasn't what a friend told her, it's what she told herself? That is the second arrow. The second arrow is always delivered by means of mental chatter. No matter what situation you are confronted by, no matter what situation is troubling you right now, your mental chatter about that situation is making it at least an order of magnitude worse. Virtually everybody. Your mental chatter creates the life that you then experience. Now, there's this toy device in playgrounds. It's not a merry-go-round, but it's like a merry-go-round. You you know, get on there, your kid gets on there, and you kind of spin it around. And it's difficult to spin it around initially. You have to exert effort. But then each time it goes around, you give it a little tap. And uh, it keeps going until it gains tremendous velocity. Do you know what I'm talking about? What's it called, by the way? OK, I think of a merry-go-round as something which is electrically operated and top. But you all get what I'm talking about, right? This thing gets tremendous, tremendous energy because you keep giving, giving it a little tap as it goes by. Your mind is exactly like that. For a lifetime now, you have these stray bits of mental chatter, some insignificant, some tremendously powerful, and it's constantly adding to the momentum of your mind, spinning and spinning and spinning. Even in the time I've been talking, how many random thoughts have come and gone? Gee, maybe I should have a, slips, uh, <coughs> a sip of water. Uh, you know, was that my phone ringing or was it someone else? Uh, uh, I got an itch on my leg, let me scratch that. Do you notice how many hundreds, thousands, millions, each one of those is adding to the momentum of your spirit? Spinning mind. And together it creates this huge agglomeration of thoughts, which is what is preventing you from seeing who you really are, which is pure awareness. Now, how many of you generally say, gee, I know my life is out of kelter, and what I really ought to do is I ought to sit down and meditate, and I've got to set up a meditation practice? Or I got to go off on a, 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 a retreat. I'll go on a 10-day Vipassana retreat. And hopefully that'll fix the problem. How many of you are of that frame of mind? It ain't going to work. <laughs> Seriously, it ain't going to work. This demon that you have between your ears has gone so uncontrolled for so long 
that if you think, and I'm going to sit down and meditate for half an hour every day, or I'm going to go off every three months and do a 10-day Vipassana retreat, it's not going to help. The best that it will... And by the way, I'm not saying you shouldn't do it, but I am telling you that the best that it will do is temporarily slow the rate of increase of the momentum of your uncontrolled mind. So how do you deal with this demon? There is only one way, and I actually first came across that from a wonderful book called The Way of the Pilgrim. Have any of you heard of Way of the Pilgrim or even read it? You have. Wonderful, huh? Nobody knows who the pilgrim was. He was Russian. He roamed around Siberia in the late 19th century, and the only thing he had was a torn woolen coat and a copy of the Bible in the Philokalia, and he constantly recited the Jesus prayer. Because, and the reason he did that is he was attending a service earlier on where one of the, where the pastor spoke about pray without ceasing. And he was very struck with that. What does it mean to pray without ceasing? And the entire book about, is about his exploration of trying to come to the point where he could pray without ceasing. And he was basically, you know, in the Orthodox Christian tradition, so therefore the Jesus prayers was appealed to him. So he recited the Jesus prayer unceasingly. If you're roaming around Siberia and the only thing you have to wear is a torn woolen coat, it's pretty adverse. He had a dislocated shoulder and no doctor he could go to, so he lived with the pain. But despite that, the state of spiritual exaltation that he was in was, is immediately perceivable, which is why when the book was discovered in the early 20th century and translated, it became an instant bestseller and a spiritual classic. The key point there is pray without ceasing. So going back to what I said earlier, you can go on your retreats and you know, uh, <clears throat> do your meditation practice. It really isn't going to help because it's like putting a Band-Aid on an arterial wound. The only way you're going to begin to stop that is stop thinking about your life as, you know, there's my spiritual life and I'm going to sit down and meditate and then there's my entrepreneur life which is going to occupy very nearly all your time. Your entire life has to be a prayer. Let me repeat that. Pray without ceasing is only accomplished if you are willing to embrace the notion that your entire life is a prayer. And everything that you do, everything that is given to you is a tool for you to work on yourself. You're a mother, you want to be the best mother you can, and you try your level best. In the process of doing that, what you're really doing is you're working on yourself. You run a business, you want to grow it up to be a billion dollar company, and then $10 billion, and you try to be the you know, most efficient CEO. In the process of doing that, what you're really doing is you're working on yourself. You're married, you want to be the best partner you can be, in the process of doing that, you're working on yourself. The only thing you ever do in life is you work on yourself. And by working on yourself, what I mean is you're trying to make the transition from an intellectual understanding that you're pure awareness to making that your lived experience. And you begin with your mental chatter. You all know it's spinning uncontrollably. What can you do about it? You can observe it. Mental chatter is not a problem. You know, you're, it's a beautiful sunny day. You're lying outside on a grassy knoll, and it's very comfortable, and you look up at the sky, and there are clouds in the sky. And you take a 10-minute nap, and you open your eyes, and those clouds are gone, and there are fresh clouds in the sky. Mental chatter is like that. 
They collide clouds in the sky. Your problem is not that you have mental chatter. Your problem is that you identify with your mental chatter. And when you identify with your mental chatter, it will drag you to all kinds of places that you do not want to go. You want to be the observer of your mental chatter, not identified with your mental chatter. And right now when I'm talking to you, can you step back and observe, oh, there's this mental chatter going on, this, what this guy is saying really seems to make sense. Can you do that? Remain the observer. And it's very powerful. I'll give you an example. Uh, how many of you here like horror movies? Anybody? I used to like horror movies when I was younger. I couldn't take them anymore. But in, when I was younger, you know, Friday the 13th, Halloween, Nightmare, I went for went to all of them. Now, let's assume you go to a horror movie. They call it a horror movie, but it's really more of a slasher movie than a horror movie. But uh, there's this uh, killer, and he's off to get the nubile girl who's only partially clothed. And she's looking around, her eyes are wide, and she's shivering. And she's going to the exact spot where you know the killer is hanging up. And you want to shout at her, no, no, don't go back. But she's looking wide-eyed and going back. And eventually, the tension gets too much for you. You can get out of it immediately. All you've got to do is look at the guy next door who's got popcorn spilled on his shirt, or you look at the exit sign, and bing, that's broken, right? You can do the same thing in real life with all of the drama that's going on. All you have to do is remember that it is a soap opera that's going on, and who you really are is pure awareness observing that soap opera. Let's assume that I'm putting in a new version of death of a salesman. And you're Willy Loman. And you were very, very successful at one time. Then bit by bit, your career disintegrates, your marriage dissolves, you try to commit suicide, and you fail. And you're going on this downward spiral. So since I have chosen you to star as Willy Loman, you really want to do a good job. And you want to get into the skin of Willy Loman and see him as his marriage crumbles, as his career disintegrates. But even as you're doing that, in the back of your mind is a thought, if I do a really good job of portraying Willy Loman, maybe I'll get an Oscar. Right? If you identify with the actor, your goal. If you identify with the character, you're screwed. Life is exactly the same way. There is stuff happening to you. It's all a great soap opera playing out, but you are pure consciousness watching all of this play out, and you do what is appropriate, you behave in a perfect fashion, but deep down you know it's all an opera playing out, and isn't it fun? You're fine. Because here is the thing, I've already told you, the entire purpose of your life is to recognize that you're pure awareness. But until you get that, you're still stuck in the illusion, right? So as long as you're stuck in the illusion, why not enjoy it and have a blast? And when you're stuck in the illusion, that's when you continue. You want to build a business and you want to make it a billion dollar business and all of it is just fine. You may succeed, you may not succeed. It doesn't really matter. Because here's one of the other things that I want to share with you. Uh, no, let me go to one other thing before that. I want you to be consider the fact that your awareness is like a flashlight. What does a flashlight do? A flashlight illuminates whatever you shine it on, correct? Shine it on the floor, lights up the floor, shine it on the ceiling, lights up the ceiling. Your awareness is like a flashlight. It illuminates whatever you shine it on. And what do you shine the flashlight of your awareness on? 
You shine it on the problems of your life. Or more importantly, on what you think are the problems in your life. Right? Now, every single one of you in this room is incredibly privileged. Do you recognize that? Do you have to bother about whether you're going to have lunch? Whether you have a bed to sleep in? Do you have a roof over your head? None of that is a concern, right? But you do recognize that any one of these is a big deal in a big chunk of the world outside, correct? So when I point it out to you, you'll say, yeah, I'm incredibly privileged. But you don't feel incredibly privileged. You feel stressed out and put upon. Why is that? It's because of where you shine the flashlight of your awareness on. Shine the flashlight of your awareness on the chair at which you're sitting. And the moment you do that, you feel the pressure of your buttocks on the seat. You can feel the polythene or whatever it is against the back of your thighs, correct? 30 seconds ago, you weren't aware of any of that, but you are now. Why? Because that's where you've shown the flashlight of your awareness. So what I want you to do is consciously, deliberately shine the flashlight of your awareness on the innumerable ways in which you're truly blessed and fortunate. I advise starting this right before you go to bed. Do it five minutes before you go to bed. And when you get up in the morning, don't go immediately to the place, oh my God, I got too much to do and not enough time to do it all. How many of you spend time in that room, I got too much to do and not enough time to do it all? Don't go there. <laughs> Consciously, deliberately bring up your flashlight of awareness and shine it on the many different ways in which you are truly blessed and fortunate. Your company might be doing terribly, but at least you have a company that you can try to turn around. And do it many times during the day. Consciously shine the flashlight of your awareness on the many ways in which you're truly fortunate. It is my hope that all of you will be able to occupy the default emotional domain of appreciation and gratitude. And the reason for that is when you're in the default emotional domain of appreciation and gratitude, you're not stressed, you're not anxious, you're not fearful, you're not nervous. The two cannot coexist. And then from the emotional domain of appreciation and gratitude, take action as needed to counter the things that you want to change in your life. Do it from that space. Okay? So coming back again, all of this you combine with the notion that I really am awareness. I'm watching this soap opera and this opera is what I used to call my life, but it's really a soap opera. And I'm enjoying it and I'm having fun. And when you go to see a movie, you know, when the you know, protagonist is having a very difficult time and you feel like crying along with that, that, that's part of what makes it an enjoyable movie, right? Your life is the same way. You're an outside observer looking in. Participate, but don't be the character. Be the actor. Remember, if you're the actor, you're gold. If you're the character, you're screwed. Now we come down to you're an entrepreneur, you've got a company, you want to really build up the company. Hey, this is part of the game that you've chosen to play in this role. So play it with gusto. Enjoy every part of it. Here is the mistake that all of us make. The mistake we make is we live a life the following way. I set a goal for myself. I tried my level best to achieve it. I succeeded. Life's a blast. Or I set a goal for myself. I try my level best to achieve it. I fail. Life sucks. We live a life oscillating on a sinusoidal curve between elation and despair. 
and you spend too much time at the despair end of the spectrum, it's a lousy way to live. There is a better way, and the better way is for you to recognize that the benefit of setting a goal and trying your level best to achieve the goal is not achieving the goal. I'm oh, sorry, not, not achieving the goal, but the benefit is not achieving the goal. The benefit of setting a goal and trying your level best to achieve the goal is the learning and growth that happen in you and to you as you try your level best to achieve the goal. If you actually achieve the goal, that is a bonus. Be immensely grateful. If you don't achieve the goal, the learning and growth have already happened, so you're ahead of the game. It's a no-lose proposition. How do you get this mindset? By constantly thinking about it. Right now, if your business crashes and burn, what would you feel? Terrible, I failed, horrible, life sucks, the universe is against me. Right? Failure is a part of life, you know, it's part of the drama that's playing out. What is important is not whether you, quote, succeed or, quote, fail. What is important is, did you do your level best? Because if you did your level best, you're always ahead of the game. And if you did your level best, you will find out that you are one step closer to realizing as a lived experience that you're pure awareness, you're not a struggling entrepreneur. your pure awareness, just enjoying your role as a struggling entrepreneur. And eventually that will transform to a hugely successful entrepreneur. Because here's the thing that I should have mentioned earlier and I didn't, because as you go down this path, there will come a time, as the pilgrim discovered, that he's no longer doing the Jesus prayer. The Jesus prayer is doing him. And that is when you don't really have to give any thought to the morrow. Your life is being lived for you rather than your living your life. And one of the things that I would strongly urge you to do is don't make life or don't make business a transaction. And whether you recognize it or not, Many of you, probably most of you, are doing that. I'll give you an example. How many of you want to deliver great customer service? All of you want to do. Why do you want to give great customer service? As one of my clients pointed out, what a dumb question. Why do you want to give great customer service? Well, I want to give great customer service because if I give great customer service, my Customers are going to be happy, and if they're happy, they're going to buy more often. They might buy more. They'll refer their friends and clients to me. So I want to give great customer service because I'll prosper if I give great customer service. True, false? That's the reason why I do You've just taken the beautiful impulse and converted it into a transaction. So what are my clients said? Why the hell would I give great customer service if I didn't get more business as a result of that? And the short answer is, you give great customer service because that is the outward manifestation of the kind of person you are. You don't have to give thought to, am I going to get more business if I give great customer service? That will happen organically in its own way. You do not put your emotional energy into that. Because if you put your emotional energy into that, what you've effectively done is you've converted it into a transaction. And mind you, that's still a lot better than a great deal of what goes on in the business world, as you all know. But I'm simply pointing out there is a better way. 
because what I'm advocating is your business is not something that you're building up for the reasons typically associated with it. Your business is a vehicle for your growth. And if your business is a vehicle for your growth, you have to approach it from a mindset which is different. And your mindset is, you're not making it a transaction, you're making it an expression of who you are. But believe me, when you do that, the transaction part of it will not only take care of itself, it'll take care of itself in spades. Take personal evaluation. Gee, you know, I got to help everyone do, be the best self they can be. It's my job to develop those who report to me and my team members. But why do you want to develop them? Well, you want to develop them because if you do, they'll do a better job. They'll meet their numbers. And if they meet their numbers, you meet their numbers and good things happen to you. That's good. But it's a better way that you'll develop them simply so that they become better human beings, that they grow and they prosper. There's a wonderful story about this. It comes from the Native American tradition, and there are many different versions, but I like the one that I'm about to share with you. And there was a young man, and he was growing up and going to take his uh, place among the adults of the tribe. And the final rite of passage was a conversation with the medicine man. And the medicine man told him, here's this dog, kind, intelligent, loving, trustworthy, and here is this wolf, malvolent, vicious, ready to snap at and kill anybody, anything. And the dog and the wolf are fighting. And the dog and the wolf are both inside you. The young man asks, which one's going to win? And the medicine man says, whichever one you feed. Now think about that. Inside each one of us, there are altruistic, let's help each other and make the world a better place impulses. And inside each one of us is a, let me grab everything I can for myself and the devil take the hindmost impulses. And the two are always at war. It's your job to selectively identify and feed the dog in you. It's also your job to selectively identify and feed the dog in everyone you meet. And when the dog in you becomes friends with the dog in the other person, magic happens in both your lives. But all too often, we are busy feeding the wolf, both in ourselves and the other person, and we don't even recognize that we're feeding the wolf. You're having a bad day at work, and you go to the coffee machine, and a colleague comes up and says, I'm having a bad day at work, and you say, you're having a bad day at work, let me tell you about my bad day at work, and your bad day at work easily trumps his bad day at work, and you go off feeling smug. You've just fed the wolf both in yourself and the other person. If instead you'd gone, you're having a bad day at work, I'm having a bad day at work, we both work in this place, is there anything that we can do to make sure nobody has such a bad day at work again and now you have started feeding the dog? So every time you have a conversation with anyone, with your partner, with your children, with your team members, with the Uber driver who takes you to the airport, ask yourself, am I feeding the dog or am I feeding the wolf? Am I saying, behaving, doing things in a manner which leaves the other person energized, full of possibility, more optimistic about himself, herself, and the state of the world? Or am I doing something which is pushing him down the vortex of despair. Am I feeding the dog or am I feeding the wolf? And just ask yourself that for every conversation you have. And the more you feed the dog in other people, 
the more the dog in you is automatically fed and energized. How much time do we have, Alex? Okay, uh, we'll skip the video in that case because I want to have some time for questions. L let me end up by giving you a very, very important lesson. This one comes from Einstein, actually. Uh, we all revere Einstein as a great scientist. He discovered the theory of relativity, the photoelectric effect. And that's why he got the Nobel Prize, by the way. He got the Nobel Prize because he discovered the photoelectric effect and not because he came up with the theory of relativity. Uh, but Einstein was also a philosopher, and he said the most important question you are ever going to ask yourself is, is the universe friendly? Let me repeat that. Einstein said the most important question you are ever going to ask yourself is, is the universe friendly? Now, we all know some people who believe the universe is friendly, and the sole purpose of the universe is to frustrate your plans. They're few in number. I don't believe we have any here. The vast majority of us in this room probably believe the universe is neither friendly nor unfriendly. The universe is indifferent to us. The universe doesn't know we exist and couldn't care less. So here I am going around doing my thing, and there's the universe going around doing its thing, and sometimes it seems to help me, sometimes it seems to hinder me, but essentially it's a random process. The universe doesn't know I exist and couldn't care less. What if the universe was aware of your existence? And what if the universe was well disposed towards you? The universe was friendly. Well, friends don't shaft friends, do they? If the universe was friendly, why does it give, why does it give you stuff that you don't want? You want to travel and go on vacation, and the universe gives you pandemics and lockdowns. Why does the universe give you stuff you don't want? Well, what if the universe was friendly, and what if the universe didn't give you what you wanted, but exactly what you needed for your learning and growth? It's like you're a small child, and you want a tub of ice cream, and your parents give you fruits and vegetables, and you don't want fruits and vegetables. You want a tub of ice cream, but your parents give you fruits and vegetables. And it isn't until you have a different level of maturity and understanding that you can say, thank God my parents gave me fruits and vegetables. What if the universe gave you exactly what you needed for your learning and growth, which may not be what you wanted, but it's exactly what you needed? Do you recognize that whether or not the universe is friendly, if you believed the universe was friendly, your experience of life would be a whole lot better, right? That's why Einstein said the most important question you will ever ask yourself is, is the universe friendly? It's a superior mental model. So how do you get around to believing the universe is friendly? Anybody interested in that question? Well, it's very simple. If you want to believe the universe is friendly, look for signs that the universe is friendly. And there's so many examples of that all over the place. What do we typically do? We say it's a coincidence. Let's say you're going to an important meeting and uh, you're running late and just as you get up to where your meeting is going to be, somebody pulls out so you have the perfect parking place and you park in there. Spend some time and acknowledge it. This is the universe producing a miracle for me. It's a sign the universe is friendly. And when you look for that, you'll be surprised at how many instances you find. Make a journal where you note down all of these. You'll have a dozen or more every day. And when you note it down in your own handwriting and you start reviewing it, you'll come to your own personal tipping point where you say, boy, if there are so many instances of the universe doing what 
is friendly? Is it possible that maybe it's a friendly universe after all? And you'll tip over into a universe where the universe is friendly, into a world where the universe is friendly. It's not very difficult, but it does take some persistent effort on your part. So when you have a friendly universe, when you're investing in the process, not the outcome, when you're spending time living in the domain of appreciation, gratitude, and you remember that your entire life is a prayer. You're observing your mental chatter and you're rooted in the knowledge that you are pure awareness. And initially when you started off, let me tell you that it'll feel totally artificial and you can't get into it. Persist anyway, because as the pilgrim describes, and that's a wonderful book for you to read, by the way, The Way of a Pilgrim. As the pilgrim describes, you begin by doing the Jesus prayer, but eventually the Jesus prayer is doing you. Your entire life, your career as an entrepreneur is nothing but a prayer. Use it as such, because that is the tool that you're using on your journey of awakening. And this, my friends, is the rest of your life journey. And you're going to forget. You start observing your mental chatter, you'll forget in seconds. Don't shoot second arrows at yourself. Bring yourself back. Remember it again and again and again. It's a journey of a thousand miles, and it begins with a step. But you can only take that single step from where you are. You can't say, I want to begin my journey of a, single, of a thousand miles, but I'll take the first step from over there. It doesn't work. You have to take the first step from exactly where you are. But when you do that, and you are also working on your business, you'll be very pleasantly surprised to find out how it flourishes without any of the stress and anxiety that are typically associated with being an entrepreneur. Because stress and anxiety are stress and anxiety only if you define them as stress and anxiety. Don't define them as stress and anxiety. Dr. Rao, thank you very much for joining My us My pleasure, Alex. Thank you.